The five unmistakable notes from Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Steven Spielberg's classic 1977 film starring Richard Dreyfuss as Roy Neary, a man who finds his quiet and ordinary life turned upside down after seeing a UFO, spurring him to an obsessed cross-country quest for answers as a momentous Close Encounter approaches. BSI presents The Standard Show, the podcast that brings you the stories behind the standards with Matthew Childs and Cindy Paragill. Today's episode is on standards and space. Those famous five notes for the film's score were written by composer John Williams. And they were chosen by Williams, apparently after trying around 350 of 134,000 possible five-note combinations available in the 12-tone chromatic scale. The five musical tones in syllables are Re, Mi, Do, Do, So, with the second Do an octave below the first. The notes themselves play a central role in the film as the basis for communication between the humans and the aliens based on what are considered to be universal acoustic principles. They are probably more well known and remembered than the story of the film itself. Dare I suggest a kind of intergalactic standard? I remember going to the cinema to see the film as a kid and it kick-started for me a lifelong love and fascination for all things science fiction and space. Hello and welcome to The Standard Show. My name is Matthew Childs and the aim of this podcast is to bring you the stories behind the standards. And in this episode, rather than looking at the issue of space and science fiction, we are very much in the realm of science fact and talking about close encounters, though not of the third or alien kind, but of the satellite kind. In 1957, Sputnik 1 was the first artificial satellite successfully placed in orbit around the Earth and was launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, then part of the former Soviet Union, heralding a space race between the United States and the USSR. Since 1957, many thousands of satellites have been launched and the numbers keep increasing. According to the Index of Objects Launched into Outer Space, maintained by UNUSA, the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, yes, really, 2021 saw a record number of objects launched into space, with 1,807 leaving the planet, a 42% increase compared to 2020. Now, to give this some context, during 2020 and 2021, 25% of the objects ever launched were launched from UNUSA's list of 31 different launch sites. And with new entrants into the space industry, such as Elon Musk's SpaceX, the number of satellites will continue to grow. However, satellites represent only a small proportion of the objects whirling around our planet. Space junk is becoming a big problem. According to the European Space Agency, there are 36,500 space debris objects greater than 10 centimetres in size, and a further 1 million space debris objects between 1 centimetre and 10 centimetres. And the number of objects between 1 millimetre and 1 centimetre in size? Well, that's a whopping 130 million. So in this episode, we'll look at what's involved in looking after this huge number of objects circling around above us at very high speeds. And we'll do this with Alex Caccioni, Director of Flight Dynamics at Inmarsat, currently the UK's biggest satellite operator. His job is to make sure that some of these satellites don't crash into each other or into other objects in the area known as the geostationary belt. Now, Alex is also a standards maker, a journey he started in 2015, working what he describes as space sustainability standards, including on the standard ISO 24113 for space debris mitigation. Also in this episode, there's a short standards desk of news, one item in fact, about a proposed new EU directive with some implications for standards to a technology that is very much closer to Earth. But before we blast off, a reminder that here on The Standards Show, we really welcome your feedback. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts, especially if you listen to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Find and follow us on Twitter at Standard Show and on Instagram at The Standard Show. And check out the show notes for all of the ways to get in touch. 
Do you want to help make people's lives easier, safer, and more enjoyable? If so, why not become a standards maker with BSI and have your say on the development of standards? Standards affect all of us every day, wherever we go, whatever we do. By defining good practice, they help people, organizations, the economy and society to do things better. We welcome applicants from all fields, backgrounds and career stages. Our goal is to have a balance of views around the table. If you want to make a difference and shape the world through standards, start your standards making journey now by visiting bsigroup.com forward slash get involved. So Alex Caccioni is Director of Flight Dynamics at Inmarsat, which operates 15 satellites at Geostationary Orbit, or GEO. I speak to Alex about satellite and space debris management generally, and how this has developed over time, including some rather famous collisions, some by accident and some, incredibly, that were carried out deliberately. Naturally, I speak to him about Standards 2 and the role they play in this particular part of the space industry. And of course, being the standard show, I get him to share his own standards journey too. But I started by asking him to tell me more about his fascinating job. Okay, this is never a dull moment. Um, it has actually evolved over the years, even if you look at my, my current position as director of flight dynamics. So I'm responsible for the station keeping fuel accounting uh, of the Imarsat uh, fleet of satellites. Uh, so we are constantly keep it in orbit so it can be used, but also looking forward, making sure that we, we, we know how much fuel we got left so we can do the proper thing and the orbit when it needs to be deorbited. And, and, and also, according to the, to the need of the organization, move them around the various locations in order to continue providing global service uh, for satellite telecommunications. Um, it has changed because over the years, the, the, the role um, has evolved, given that, now we need to um, make sure that we don't uh, crash into any space debris that is out there. Okay. I want to I want to come back to that space debris. So so your job then really you're making you've got your fifteen satellites. Your job is to make sure they stay in orbit and don't crash into anything. Pretty much, <laughs> in a nutshell. From the beginning of the space age, uh, the nine thousand objects have been launched. Okay, to date. Now. You say, okay, if we launch 9,000 objects, how can we got a problem? Well, there have been explosion, fragmentation, um, collisions. So at the moment, the space debris population, as it is known, it's roughly 20,000 objects. This is what we can track from Earth with optical sensor. Okay, We know about 20,000 objects out there. And we only go down to really 30 centimeters in size because then it's more than we can't see them at geo altitude. Uh, now, what may be um, interesting, if it's not scary, is that in the next few years, uh, there are plans to launch another 46,000 objects. Now, the trouble is that when you put up a satellite, uh, it goes out with a rocket, and then there is the third stage of the rocket that stays out there because it gets spawned off with a satellite. So 9,000 9, active satellites were launched. There is 5,600 satellite, active satellites at the moment. Okay, 10% of them are, are at GEO, the rest are, are at LEO. GEO is the geostationary orbit, is actually uh, situated at 42,164 kilometers from the center of the Earth, with an Earth radius of 6,378. Um, so it, it is, you know, 22,000 22, miles away from here. And the GEO is recognized, the belt, at that altitude, plus or minus 200 kilometers. Okay, now anything which is between zero and 2,000 kilometers in height is deemed to be LEO, a low Earth, um, Earth orbiting satellite. Okay, So the, the characteristic of a geostationary satellite, as the word says, is stationary with respect to the Earth, meaning if you place a satellite over the UK and you leave it there pretty much, it will keep rotating at the same angular speed as the Earth, meaning that it keeps staying over the UK. Okay, so it, theoretically, you only need three satellites at geo to cover the whole world because you've got roughly 120 degrees field of view from out there. You cover 120 degrees of the Earth. Now, when you come down to Leo, 
you're much closer. So what happens is if you want to have a global coverage of the Earth, you need a lot more satellites to, to give a global. You're a lot closer, so you need a lot less power to reach down the Earth. You need a, uh, a smaller antenna. It's a smaller satellite. But then the pass over the UK will be 20 minutes, depending on the height that you choose for your orbit, which is typically anything. Between. The, the, the space station is at 400 kilometers, just to give you an idea, a ballpark figure. LEO satellites will be anything between 600 to 1,500 kilometers. But then they, they, they don't stay over a fixed point on the Earth. They keep going round and round very fast, very quickly. Now, you mentioned there, Alex, about we had 9,000 9, uh, satellites, but now it's created 20, there's also the 20,000 items yeah. so, orbiting the Earth. So including those 9,000, we've got a lot of debris out there. Now, people might be a bit worried and think, so, OK, there, there have been collisions then have created this additional these additional items more than 30 centimetres long. Is that right? Correct. Some, some are intentional, believe it or not. Some are pure accidents. Um, so, for instance, uh, um, th there are a, a couple of well-known ones in the world. Uh, the Feng Yun 1 intercept, um, it, it was an anti-satellite test. Um, so, effectively, a satellite was shot down from the Earth just to prove that was in 2007, to prove that it can be done. But that generated 3,800 fragments. Okay. Uh, but then there was also a collision. Uh, the, 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 the famous or infamous one is the Iridium Cosmos that happened in 2009. Okay, that collision made history. Um, that created, uh, uh, I think, 2,500 fragments from two satellites. One was a defunct satellite um, that was going over a polar orbit. So when we said defunct, it was no longer being controlled. It was going round and round. But the other was an active satellite, the Iridium satellite. Um, the collision happened. And after that collision, it was the uh, U.S. Department, if not the President of the United States, that say we need to make sure that, that those type of accidents don't happen anymore in the whole world. So at that point, a space catalog, which is, there is only one space catalog uh, which is available, let's say for free, uh, is coming from the U.S. Department uh, uh, DOD um, and, and was made available to the public. So the public could use it to screen and see where these, these objects are so you can avoid them. So in a sense, when that catalog was made available in 2009, our workload increased because as part of our job, we also need to make sure that our orbit does not come in conjunction with any other space debris orbit. So there's so a lot would, more screening to do. So would that be saying, you, had, you said you had your 15, would you then have to be your negotiating the path for your 15 satellites amongst these 20,000 pieces of debris? Yes. Wow. Yes. There is a process that is called L-COLA, which is launch collision <laughs> avoidance. So you effectively have a trajectory with the uh, space launcher, whichever one you've selected um, for, uh, uh, to, to take you into space. And, and you provide that trajectory to, to, um, to what is called uh, uh, CSPOC, it is the Combined Space Operations Center in the States that holds the space catalog. And say, look, this is the trajectory uh, that you no, know, we've got in mind because obviously when you launch a satellite, there is a window for launch in order that you can optimize your ascent into orbit and use the minimum amount of fuel to get there. Okay, but obviously you we need to make sure that that part is clear from space debris. So we provide a launch window, the trajectory, and we pass it on. We, we normally give it two weeks um, before the launch date, and they screen against the catalog, and they get back to us with a go or a no go. Some of these items, Alex, I'm just thinking, um, you know, when, you, when they have those collisions, do some of those items also leave the atmosphere too? Is it that powerful a collision for, for, to do that or not? Okay, just to put in perspective, satellite at geo, uh, go, because we say they go around at the same angular speed as the Earth, so you, one rev a day. So for us, it takes 24 hours, you go through a day and a night. But they're so much further away that the, the, the speed that they go at is much faster than, than, than you think. They go at three kilometers per second. It's roughly 11,000 kilometers per hour. That's the speed they go to. So if you do have a collision at that speed, you can only imagine what that happens. When you come down to Leo, their speed is seven kilometers per second. You're talking about 20,000 uh, uh, kilometers per hour. So it, it, it's, 
mind-boggling the type of speed these objects go to, okay? Um, so if you have a collision at LEO on these ASAT tests, okay, anti-satellite test, there was one uh, uh, done in, in 2019, the Shak, uh, I think it was called the Shakti. He, he created 270 pieces of debris. There is now only 50. Because it happened at a relatively low altitude, if, if your object, when it goes around the Earth, drops below uh, the perigee, which is the point where it's closest to the Earth, it's around 300 kilometers or less, it, it, it suffers from orbit decay uh, given the atmosphere, basically. So they will eventually decay and come back down to Earth. The trouble is at geo, if you do have an accident at geo, it will not come down to Earth. The, 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 the debris will scatter around the geo belt within a day. And it, so it will never leave that geo that It will never orbit. leave the geostationary orbit. Not only that, it will not only affect the, the, um, um, the location where the accident happened, but will pollute the whole geo art, the whole 360 degrees of the geo belt, making it almost unusable for everybody, which is why it is extremely important that we take all the necessary steps to make sure that no accident happens in space full stop for the whole community. It's not sufficient to say, as long as I don't have an accident, my 15 satellites for Imar Sat are okay. Because if a neighbor has an accident, or even at 90 degrees away from where you are in longitude, or 180 degrees away, it will reach you within a day. You mentioned earlier, um, Alex, you said there had been 9,000 satellites launched to date. And then you, you mentioned, was it tw another 36,000 to come in the next five years? The the Yeah, w the, what we know with the applications is there is about 46,000 objects 46, that estimated, yeah, to be launched in the next few years. Uh, SpaceX, Starlink, uh, the original license had 12,000 objects. They're at LEO. It's what currently Elon Musk uses to provide internet connectivity around the world. Now, uh, he's requested in October 19 an addition of a, a, another 30,000 satellites to be added to that constellation, for instance. OneWeb had an original license of 650. Well, in May 2020, they requested up to 48,000. So we have then, so if you've got, we've got our existing 20,000 20, objects plus the 46, so 66,000 objects in the next five years. This is going to sound a daft question because I love, all, I love all this scale stuff. So the geo belt, I mean, is there, a, is there a limit to how many items can be in the belt? It depends how big the object is, right? Um, when when uh, part of the job that we do is to calculate the probability of collision, and believe, believe it or not, the, we, we, we are talking about very small numbers. We act upon a probability of collision which is greater than 10 to the minus 4. To us, that is a risk that we do not take. So if the risk is, oh, there is a risk of collision which is 10 to the minus 4, we will actually move the satellite. Uh, so... We need to take everything into account, uh, not only the uncertainty, but also the size of the object. Some of our satellites, the body is seven meters long, and it depends the direction of, of the object. If the object is coming you know, towards the solar array and it's uh, perpendicular to the solar array, the, the surface that it's going to hit is quite flat. But if it's coming in uh, aligned with the solar array, it's quite thin. So what are the chances of that hitting that solar array? So... There is a lot that goes into the probability of collision. Um, to get but it who, right. who get? I mean, in a sense, then that you know, we, we could fill the geo belt with with more items. Who gets to decide how many items should be up there? That's a very interesting question. Uh, the ITU. Clarifications corner here. The ITU is the International Telecommunication Union, the United Nations Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. The ITU sets and publishes regulations and standards relevant to electronic communication and broadcasting technologies of all kinds, including radio, television, telephone, the internet, and satellites. Assigns slots, uh, which are longitude that you, um, you're allowed to, to operate based on frequency. 
okay? So it's not uncommon that, for instance, we are allowed to operate at a certain longitude over um, a, a specific frequency, C-band, KA, KU, L-band, S-band, or, or military operate on X-bands. But if there is no interference, they can allocate the same slot to someone else. So here's the problem. The ITU says there is no interference between operator A and operator B, but we both want to be at the same spot to operate. So who, who gets right away? So one solution is it is possible to, uh, is known as co-location. You can have more than one satellite at the same longitude. We need to know where each other plans are, what the ephemeris are, which is the evolution of the orbit. Uh, exactly what it is, so you can avoid it. You can put up to four satellites that will effectively stay separated by roughly 20 kilometers from each other at any one time. That's the, the closest that we'll get, even though they're all operating at the same longitude. These are with satellites that are cooperating. But it is impossible to do if the other satellite operator is not cooperating, is not passing the families of the maneuver plans. So who gets who gets to crack the heads together then? Because I was going to ask you about that. How, how many operators, how many people like you are, are, are managing their, their sort of group of satellites? The, there are four companies which are known as the big four in the industry, which form the SDA, the Space Data Associations. There is Inmarsat, there is Intelsat, they are American, they, they, they have over 50 satellites. In Europe, there is also UTELSAT, they're based in Paris. Uh, they have uh, more than 50 satellites. And, and there is also SES, based in Luxembourg, and, and they've got over 50 satellites. So between the four of us, we have the majority of the satellites in the GeoArc. Now, responsible operators, which are not only, only these big four, will cooperate with each other. As I said before, one single accident uh, a geo will effectively um, corrupt the whole geo belt for everybody and, and it will make it impossible to use. And it's it's a unique resource because of the height that is at. The satellite will stay uh, over the same uh, spot pretty much. We need to do maneuvers to keep it in there. But it's not like a Leo that he's got a pass and every you've got a 20 minutes uh, over your head and before it disappears again. It stays over you. And that's unique. If you start to move away from that altitude, the satellite will start to drift east or west, a degree per day, two degrees per day, three degrees per day, meaning that it's over the UK and then it, it goes over the Atlantic and then over the States and then it keeps going around and will come around, I don't know, in a year from now. And, and you know, so we need to make sure that the, the, the geo belt stays protected for everybody, for the sustainability, for the future, for, for the future generation, for the future of our satellite, which is why when we deorbit the satellite, we need to make sure we deorbit properly. We, we put it away from the geo belt and we need to propagate for over 100 years to make sure it doesn't come back into the geo belt because of solar and, and lunar uh, um, perturbations that affect the orbits effectively. So do you, do you work alongside your three other counterparts then to do that? Do you sort of, do you cooperate? We... We cooperate with everybody, meaning that I really need to cooperate with my neighbor, whoever that is. Now, as it happens, we have satellites co-located with Intelsat, so we exchange ephemeris on those satellites, but, but we exchange with Intelsat because they are our neighbor. Um, we also have one of our satellites that operates um, along with uh, Hellasat, a Greek operator from Athens. They have two satellites, but one of theirs is co-located with ours. So... We, we co collaborate with each other to make sure we know exactly where we both are so we can avoid each other. But ultimately, the, the ITU, they would, they would determine where you're going to put the satellite. Not exactly. The ITU will give you the right to be at that location to transmit at, um, at a particular frequency. So, for instance, the satellite with Hellasat, we use, it, we use the S-band and they use the, the KU-band. So we're not interfering with each other, but we're both in the same space. Oh, I see. So the ITU issuing the license for the effectively for the for the satellite to operate and do what it needs to do based on the frequency. Yeah, but who who is which organisation deciding uh, where you are in in space effectively? There isn't one as such. When we launch a satellite, we need to ask permission to the uh, licensing authority. And this is the licensing authority of the country that 
you're operating the satellite. So Inmarsat operating in the UK needs to ask permission to the UK Space Agency. If you're an operator in the US, you need to ask the FCC. Uh, and the licensing agency in France is going to be mm-hmm. CNES, and so on and so forth. And each licensing agency um, imposes their own rules, some more or less strict than others. Okay? So... Um, the UK Space Agency is very thorough and, and it's good. So they make sure that they issue a license if we can operate the satellite. We need to prove to them how we operate, where we're going, the minimum separation, how we will do it, basically. We need to mm-hmm. prove it to them. Uh, but um, because the space environment is changing with the number of satellites that have been launched and will be launched, It's moving at a faster pace than it's ever been. Therefore, we need to make sure that the rules that we follow, as I say, the orbit in the satellite, the first European satellite was launched, was the orbit at 40 kilometers above geo. Well, there was only one satellite. We'll move it away. We'll put another one. No one knew that effectively uh, uh, 40 years later, 45 years later, we're in a situation that there are so many objects that we need to push them out further to make sure that there is space for everybody to keep using the geo belt as a resource. This is, this is a daft question that, that my nine-year-old self, myself would ask, but how far can you go before you start drifting away from the Earth? How, how, what's the furthest point? When you say push it further away, what okay. is that point of no return? As a rule of thumb, if you're a geo, you're, you're at the same angular speed. Okay, So you, you, if you're over the UK, you stay over the UK. Now, you need to move only um, 78 kilometers above or below geo, either way, to drift one degree per day. Ah, uh-huh, got you. So in, over time, you would drift away from the, Earth, uh, the, the orbit of the Earth. And, and yes. So if you, if you then are below or above geo, that means you drift east or west. But, you know, either way, you start drifting away. So it's only a matter of time because you're no longer over the UK. Okay. I mean, I know it's, it might be difficult for you to answer this, but obviously a tremendous amount of growth in the next five years. I just wonder, you know, if you were speculating 20, 30, 40 years time, you know, where, h- how big, are, how many more items are we going to have up there? Interesting. Actually, it was the last century, if not the last millennium, the NASA scientist Kessler predicted that, that what is known now as the Kessler syndrome, which is effectively there are go- there are going to be so many objects in space then it's going to be impossible to find a clear path to space, meaning that the object will start to collide with each other, and each collision will create more debris and, fr- and fragments that will keep colliding with each other to make space inaccessible for everyone. So, so you're saying that once once we get to the point where we may have to leave the planet, we won't be able to leave the planet? <laughs> no. <laughs> it won't be easy. <laughs> So when, I, when you see, when you watch a lot, I watch a lot of science fiction, when you see them just blast away, there's no plotting that seems to take place. They just hit warp drive and then off they go. It just won't be like that. We'll be sitting there making lots and lots of calculations to weave our way through a path through all this debris that is literally bouncing off each other. Is that, what, yeah. is that the principle? <laughs> yes. Well, I think Hollywood is catching up. Wasn't that a film with, with um, um, was it called Orbit? With... Um... Well, effectively, the, the um, astronaut in space get hit by a... Col- they, they have a it was gravity, was it? Gravity. gravity. That's Sandra it. Bullock, gravity. Yeah. Sandra yeah. Bullock. That's the one. That's the one. That was done in coordination with NASA for the reality of... Uh, but it, it, it is, you know, um, a distinct possibility. It's not fiction anymore. Now, we'll pick up the rest of my conversation with Alex shortly. But for now, it's time for the Stanner's Desk of News. Just one item this time, common charging cables. Yes, this is the news that the European Union has provisionally agreed that all new portable electronic devices must, by autumn 2024, use a USB Type-C charger, a move it says will benefit consumers. The directive will not only apply to smartphones, but a wide range of products. Tablets, e-readers, earbuds, digital cameras, headphones and headsets, handheld video game consoles, portable speakers and portable navigation devices will also have to use USB-C ports, with laptops having to conform in 2026. 
In announcing the proposal, the European Commission presented the common charging solution as a win for consumers and the environment, arguing it would contribute to potential consumer savings of 250 million euros a year and a reduction in e-waste related to mobile charging devices, estimated as 11,000 tonnes per year. The agreement also includes a plan to let consumers choose whether or not they want a charging cable with their new electronics. The Commission has also pledged to issue a mandate to develop harmonised standards in wireless charging within 24 months after the new rules come into force. With the announcement, attention has been placed on Apple, which is currently the biggest manufacturer to use a custom charging port exclusive to some of its products. Its iPhone uses an Apple-made Lightning connector. The UK government says it's not currently considering copying European Union plans for a common charging cable. For development in this particular story, well, as they say, we'll have to watch this space. And that's the Standards Desk of News. Now, in the first part of my conversation with Alex, we talked about how relatively crowded the LEO and GEO belts are becoming, and about how the preemptive changes in satellite positions taken by satellite flight operators to avoid collisions are based on incredibly small chances of probability of these collisions actually happening. We start this second part by talking about standards. We better talk about, about standards here, uh, Alex. I just wonder, you know... Um, what are the key space standards that support the work that you do? Yes, very, a very good question. In fact, um, the, the I would name what is the key standard that is out there at the moment. It, it's ISO standard two four one one three. That's the number, uh, and it it, it it is space debris mitigation, effectively. Um, that standard, okay, it is rather complicated in the sense that there is what is known the IADC, the Interagency uh, Space Debris, um, which provides guidelines, okay? So the ISO standard is based on the AIADC guidelines, pretty much, Um now, those guidelines were, were drafted for the first time, was it 2004? Uh, and and who, who belongs to the IADC? Are all the national space agencies, including European space agencies, and NASA, the Japanese one, JAXA, the Indian one, ISRO, all of them put together, they issue guidelines, okay? Um, however, at ISO level, we turn those guidelines, based on those guidelines, we... we turn them into a standard. And that standard has been changing quite a lot. Given the recent changes that have happened to the space uh, age in the last few years, we're trying to catch up. So I'll give you an idea. The, the standard, we, we are currently edition three, which was published in 2019. Okay. So the current edition of, of, of the space debris 24113 was published in November uh, or July. Uh, 2019. The previous issue was 2011. It took us eight years to to go one rev up. And eight years is not fast enough for those standards to be up issued. Okay, so it covers the majority of the guidelines, but then there are there are um, lower level standards which have been written, they cover the specific for launch vehicles and for satellites. So how that, on a day-to-day basis then, how, how does that standard, as in Marsat, how, how does that standard, as a, as a standards user, what does that do for you? Well, it's interesting. When I started, when I started uh, uh, over 30 years ago, when those special operations came, i.e. we need to move a satellite from longitude X to longitude Y for the business, or more importantly, when you run out of fuel and you need to de- you need to deorbit the satellite, how do I do it? Well, there isn't. Um, it's not a satellite manufacturer that does it. So internally, there is always someone 
that has been there a long time when I started, they knew how to do it. The, the pre-ISO standard or pre-IADC guidelines, I mean, they were published in 2001 or 2004 for the first time around. How did people do it? Well, probably there wasn't a standard because there were not so many satellites, so people did it to the best of their ability, shall we say. But now we come into a space sustainability issues. We need to make sure that we look at a way that makes space sustainable for the future. So that's why the IADC guidelines and the ISO standard I've written with that in mind. There is a lot of research, a lot of analysis, a lot of technical specification report that goes behind it to prove that that is the right strategy. And is this is this standard being? Uh, I mean, is it is it? used across the industry it is it is taken as read that you will use this standard in order to carry out your work yes and again i mentioned before that for you to operate a satellite as a satellite operator you need to ask permission to your licensing authority for us the licensing the, the uk space agency so the uk space agency will make use the well, i'm not saying they make use of the standard because it's Imarsa will eventually do be the satellite, but I will ask all the right questions. What are you going to do at the end of life? But, and you say, oh, we follow standard 24113. Now, as a generic statement, we said that GeoBelt is the uh, geostationary altitude plus or minus 200 kilometers. Okay. So you could think that, okay, so as long as I go at 201 kilometers from, from the geostationary altitude, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Well, you're not, because in the ISO standard, you'll find the exact formula that you need to apply, and the formula takes into account the sonar lunar perturbation over 100 years that will make your orbit decay, not in a way that will come down to Earth, but in a way will come back into the, into the geo belt. So there is a formula that takes into account the, the cross-section to mass ratio of the satellite, i.e., what is, the, propor- what, what is the, the face of the satellite that will face the sun because the solar wind will affect its orbit effectively. So when you plug that formula in, you will find that your your minimum altitude is at least 235 kilometers. And on top of that, with the solar lunar perturbation, we end up at something along the lines of 300 kilometers above geo in the end. So this is a standard at its heart then about assisting with with effectively your incredibly important calculations for orbit. Yes. The 24113, the space debris mitigation requirement, is the generic standard. It will try to make sure that there are no um, no events that generate debris. So it covers, for instance, uh, uh, um, making sure there are no explosion in space because the spacecraft is built to a certain standard. You need to take certain precaution. Um, the, 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 there is a, a management plan that makes sure that when you operate a satellite, you stay clear of debris. Um, it, it will dictate um, how the launch vehicle, how many objects it can release into into the space debris environment when it launches a satellite. So, as a flight operator, as a flight operator, then this 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 particular standard is absolutely core and essential to the work that you do. It is. It is. But more importantly, I think I'd like to say that the big operators are familiar with this standard. But it's becoming more important because, as we've seen with the number of of, of, um, of satellites being launched in, in the future, there are a lot of CubeSat or university. It's like an experiment. Oh, let's launch a satellite. Well, we are trying to make sure that nobody has an accident. So we publish what it is right to do in the environment for people that don't know how to do it. So it is very important. So if you are a new satellite operator, you, you buy one satellite and you've got the money and you want to launch it, you need to know how to do it. Now, I've asked you one here, Alex. It's, it's fantastic to hear you talk about, about the work that you, that you do uh, in, uh, sort of <laughs> with space. Um, but you're also a, a standards maker. So I'm keen to find out, you know, what's, what's been your standards journey? How and when did it start for you? And where are you now? Yeah, interesting. It, it, it started... It started in uh, 2015, effectively, when because in, in the UK, BSI, uh, British Standard Institute, uh, is effectively uh, the, the, the organization that, that, that provides experts to collaborate on standards. But in order to do that, is doing the right thing in trying to get the right expert for the right subject. So 
being this a space debris standard, now it's also important to say that I was lucky enough that now the standard needs to be approved. There are countries that have a, a, a voting um, for, for for a particular standard. The, the UK is actually the chair for the space debris mitigation. Okay, so it means that it's heavily involved in the draft of the standard. Now, it's important to say that the way the standards are written with all the countries that contribute, we try our best to get a consensus from all country. Okay? All the countries that, that participate to the standard. Now, at the time in 2015, because Inmarsat was and still is the biggest UK operator, the BSI thought, okay, who at Inmarsat can we call upon uh, expertise-wise to contribute to this subject. So that's how I started. Okay, The convener of the working group that was looking after the standard, uh, it was being led by the UK. So I was very lucky in that regard because it was already been led by the UK, Dr. Hadley Stoke. And therefore, I contributed with my knowledge on satellite and space and so on and so forth. It is a lot harder to get into the standards. If you receive a document, you need to provide comments and you don't know the background, you don't know. Um, and I've got to say, BSI provides you training with all the development of the standard from the preliminary work item to the new proposal that becomes a working draft and a committee draft and then draft international, final draft. And what you can do at each and every stage, it's a very rigorous process, which is why the standard is not quick. It's got to go through all these processes and there's only so much you can do at each and every one of these uh, 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 of these stages. For instance, if you are already at an FDs, a final draft international standard, well, any comment that you provide can be editorial or, 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 or the, that level, but fundamentally, you cannot add a new requirement. Okay? So, now, because the space environment has been changing so quickly, this standard, we are now up issuing again, hopefully we managed this year, considering that we took eight years from 2011 to 2019, we are planning to up issue it again to, issue, to, to edition four by the end of 2022, so three years from the previous edition, we fast-track the app issue because of the fast-paced environment. Okay? So we are trying to deal, we, we are trying to include things of the probability of success of disposing your satellite, successfully disposing your satellite, at least 90%. Uh, but the, 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 there is a lot going on, but it's still not fast enough. Okay, but what happened because of all these um, the, these um, environment changes? There are new standards being written. They're not standards yet. I've got a number, but it hasn't been made into a standard. Is in the FD stage maybe. Some of them uh, are, are new work work item proposal. So new work item proposal that was approved uh, last November is something to do with um, STC space traffic coordination. This is something that didn't exist five years ago or even three years ago. So it, it, there was a proposal that was called STCM, Space Traffic Coordination and Management. But effectively, you know, an entity that manages all this space debris and coordinates with the satellite operator to make sure that there are no accidents. That's a new standard. It, it, it's being written as we speak. Um, another new standard that I'm involved with, um, it's an NFD stage, so it won't be long before it sees. Yeah. It, it's, um, um, it, it's rendezvous with proximity operations. Because of all this uh, space debris, there are a lot of incentives from government, from space agents in general, to uh, and a lot of startups latch on to that uh, for act, what is known as active space debris removal. Okay, so you launch a satellite with a grappling mechanism, with a net, with something that goes out there, retrieve a piece of junk that is known, uh, and brings it down to Earth. However, how do you go and intercept without making another accident and causing so many more fragments? So another standard for the rendezvous and proximity operation, there is a way that you um, approach these, uh, second, th these other objects, and then you, you dock it 
It's been done with the ISS. When new astronauts go up, they talk to the ISS, they know exactly what it is. And astronauts go onto the space station or come down. But trying to do it at, you know, 10 or 20,000 kilometers per hour with the other object not being controlled and possibly tumbling and spinning at the same time um, is not that easy. So that's another new standard that's been written. And that has been simply um, written because of the changing environment. Therefore, um, yes, my involvement or my contribution has been changing or evolving or, or, or getting into more technical uh, uh, knowledge of the space in general. Five years ago, this rendezvous with proximity operation didn't exist. The space traffic management didn't exist. It was only 24113. So that, that's been the core standard. I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned some other ones there in development. ISO 16158, avoiding collisions among orbiting objects. That's yes, been published recently one as well. W- one that is, um, okay, the 24113 has been issued uh, uh, in 2019, but it's been changed so that there is only, before he had so many low-level standards, one of them is the one that you just mentioned. The idea is to, to only have two. To, to, to low level standards. One is 23312, which is effectively the de- detailed space debris mitigation requirement for spacecraft. And the other one is the de- detailed space debris mitigation requirement for launch vehicles. So that's the final idea to simplify, have the 24013 as a top level standard and two, levels, two low level standards, one that deals with the satellite and one that deals with launch vehicles, where you've got a lot more details on how to do it. Got to ask you, Alex. As a obviously, you've been involved uh, in this for your for your expertise in in working in this in this field. I just wonder, having a seat around the table to uh, develop the standard, how important has that been for for Inmarsat? I mean, in a sense, you you describe there how um, you'd receive you would receive the standard after a certain length of time if you're if you were a user. But actually, you've been involved in the development. How how important is that for your employer? Uh, it is very important because. Uh, <clears throat> Inmarsat is also planning, um, it just announced last year, the arrival of, of a LEO constellation. It's not going to be in the thousands, okay, in the hundreds maybe. However, when you, you say, oh, we're going to be launching one satellite or 10 satellites or N satellites at this orbital regime, it's important that you know what it is that you need to do because you buy the satellite. So when you, what you, you want to buy a car, you go to the car dealer and you buy a car. With the satellite, it's slightly different. You specify the satellite that you want to buy. Okay? And when you specify, you say, oh, I shall have enough fuel to stay in orbit for so many years. And by the way, at the end of my mission, which is N years, I shall be able to re-enter into the Earth in one year, in two years, in five years, the standard will say at Leo that you, you shall re-enter within 25 years. Yeah, But the standard has been written considering that not all satellites are maneuverable. Some of them are launched and the orbit will slowly decay into basically and fall back into the Earth. But that shall not take any longer than 25 years. Now, you can imagine that if you are Starlink and you are about to launch another 30,000 satellites, if each one of them takes 25 years to come down, well, you can't put another one in its place until that one has, has made way. So obviously, Starlink has a keen interest to make sure that they orbit their satellite quickly. Well, that cannot be done if you don't have the fuel. You cannot stop a fuel pump and refill your satellite. So that has to be done up front meaning that you need to specify to the satellite manufacturer that you want a satellite that shall be reorbited or deorbited in quickly, defined quickly. Six months, one year, five years. So it's got an effect. So knowing what the standard is and what is the right thing to do will make sure that the specification of the new satellite yet to be launched is correct and that you will be able to achieve your mission and do the, the proper thing for the space sustainability and clear the orbit. Now, I've got to say, it was an absolute pleasure for me to speak to Alex about his fascinating job and about some of the relationship between standards and space. 
After we'd finished recording, we got chatting about some of the other developments in space exploration and about space tourism in particular. And we both wondered, or dare to dream really, that given how fast technology can change, that maybe one day, rather than just leaving it to billionaires and multimillionaires, we might get to visit space ourselves. Now, coming back down to Earth, I was struck by the fact that, towards the end of our conversation, Alex was talking not only about the importance of standards for the work that he does, but also about the importance of being involved in standards development, both for him professionally and for his employer in Marsat too. And it seems to me that as the LEO belt in particular becomes increasingly populated with satellites and debris and more difficult to navigate, the role of satellite flight directors such as Alex and the role of standards will become ever more important to help ensure that sustainable space environment he talked about. Now, if you want to find out more and have your own close encounter with standards for space, including ISO 24113 for space debris mitigation, then check out the links in the show notes. You have been listening to an episode of The Standard Show with Matthew Childs and Cindy Parakil. Subscribe to us now wherever you get your podcasts. You just heard a stripped media production.